Good evening. Glad to see you tonight. Let's all stand. Take your hymnals 439. 439, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Number 439 there. 439, Dwelling in Beulah Land. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. On that second, 439 on the second. Far below the storm of doubt upon the world is beating. Sons of men in battle long the enemy withstand. Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can reach me. Tis Beulah land, I'm living on the mountain, underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain, that never shall run dry. Yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. stormy breezes blow their cry cannot alarm me i am safely sheltered here protected by god's hand here the sun is always shining here there's not can harm me i am safe the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply. Just a little out of breath after that. Here's what I want you to do. Say on that verse there, 439. We're going to sing that last verse again. Then you talk about what is Beulah Land. Look at that last verse. Viewing here the works of God, I sink in contemplation. Talking about what he planned. And then it says, dwelling in the spirit here, I learn of full salvation. That's what he's talking about. Hey, walk in the spirit. Let's sing it out on that last that you're singing. Well, let's sing again on that last. Lift it up on that chorus on that last. Viewing here the works of God, I see the contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the spirit, here I learn a full salvation. 
Pages over 435. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. 435. 435 on that first. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll Yonder I'll be there On that bright and cloudless morning When the dead in Christ shall rise And the glory of his resurrection share When his chosen ones shall gather To their home beyond the skies And the roll is called up Yonder I'll be there When the roll is called up Yonder When the roll is called up Yonder When the roll yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder singing this evening. You may be seated. This time, Pastor will come with the announcements. Amen. Real quick, anybody have a testimony? Wow. I know I caught you by surprise. Yes, ma'am. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We'll let Pastor know you made it. Amen. What a blessing. Amen, church? Miss a little bit of fishing time. Amen? Amen. Glad you're here tonight. Somebody else? Yes, Miss Sharon. Good, good stuff. Yes, sir, Brother John. Somebody else? Somebody's phone wanted to talk. That's a digital testimony. Somebody else? Yes, Miss Stella.
Amen. God's timing. Amen. That's good. One more. Brother Howard. Amen. Hey, church, we've been, how, how many years have we been? Probably two or so. Praying. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. I just got excited, too. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Brother Ken Durham said he'd preach tonight, but the message would be real short. I tried to sit in his chair, and I told him I wasn't giving up that easy because I had a two-hour message, but I tried to squeeze it down some. All right, so all God's people said, amen. amen. <laughs> all right, let's get to the announcements. Uh, uh, when Brother Ian comes back, Brother Ian doesn't know this, we're going to do you pick them tonight, all right? So you start figuring out. You only get one verse, all right? But I tell you what it does for me. It helps me see your heart. What you like to sing about, what's important to you, it helps me as your preacher know those things. And so we're not going to do a whole lot, but uh, about five of them, okay? So we'll get five in, just one verse. All right, good, good. Well, let me just give you the men's prayer breakfast coming up this Saturday, and then let's be in prayer for uh, the Rogers family and uh, the meeting next Sunday, or the not next Sunday, but September 4th has been canceled. And so they will not be able to be with us. But on September 5th, we're headed down to the Labor Day Conference. Those that want to go, uh, you need to plan to leave about 8 o'clock. You get down there uh, about 11, uh, time for a little lunch, get to the church by 12, and maybe you'll get a seat, all right? Just maybe, all right? It's an exciting time. People love the preaching there. And so um, what a blessing it is as we look forward to the Labor Day Conference there at Bella Vista Baptist Church. And then uh, September 18th, our new Sunday school classes will begin, excited about that. And then September 22nd, Brother Ian and Miss Lauren start their deputation. And uh, will you guys be with us on that, or will you be away? Give me a second. Oh, that's a Thursday, okay. So, I, okay, I was a little bit nervous about that. So, so anyways, we'll be looking forward to them starting their deputation time, just praying that God will bless that. Church, let's do this. Let's pray that the goal is this, to raise the support needed within a year. Amen? So let's start praying that God would uh, uh, lead the right churches to get behind them and see that work established in Delta, Colorado. Amen? That's, a, that's just exciting times for us. Uh, sweet and sour, right? I mean, we hate to see them go. Uh, you guys are going to really hate it when I start playing the piano, all right? <laughs> Uh, you're going to be like, Pastor, you cannot do that, all right? You're hurting us, all right? But uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, going to just just praying that God will do great and mighty things, and we think of other families that need the gospel, amen? And uh, we've been up there soul winning in that town, and uh, what a blessing, what a great open door, what a great open door, and so we praise God for that. All right, Brother Ian. Okay, stay seated. Now, anyone that has a song, one more soul. 117. Number 117. When I survey the wondrous cross, 117. On that first there, 117. When I survey. Living by faith, number 547. 547. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith. Come on, save in his sheltering 
434 I don't know that one <laughs> 547 547 no, that's what we just did <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Miss Priscilla, what did you have? 142. Miss Lawrence might try that one. 140, number 140. He lives, I serve a risen Savior. 140. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. and 70 170 the comforter has come number 170 170 the comforter has come oh spread the tidings round wherever man is found wherever human hearts and human wars abound let every Christian tongue Last one, Brother Ken. Yes, sir. 444, 444. I've got a mansion, 444. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. Man, what a blessing. I tell you, my testimony tonight, it just did my heart good to have my parents sitting out here and Brother Ronnie's parents sitting out here on the same row. And uh, people that hang around together, you know, sometimes they get tired of each other. Uh, but uh, Brother Ronnie and I played football 
uh, against, well, I played for BBS, and he played for College Heights. And, uh, boy, we used to have a good time way back in the day, all right, when we were still teenagers, all right? So uh, we enjoyed a lot of that, but I'm just glad for them and uh, being in, in the service here tonight. And, you know, my, my heart is, is heavy even as uh, Miss Woolley had to move down to Albuquerque family, taking care of her down there, and then just others, Miss Clara uh, in, in the nursing home here in the, in the area, and uh, then uh, Miss Jenny had to call me up this morning, not doing good, and Miss Joanne Anderson, and you know, just uh, Bo and Nell, uh, just people that, that uh, love College Heights Baptist Church and wanna be a part of it still, and thankful that, that they're here and watching online, it means so much. I did notice something. I had three bachelors come in late. I'm just going to say, gentlemen, uh, you might need a wife, all right? So <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, all right, 5 o'clock, all right, 5 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, I won't pick, I won't say any names, all right, <laughs> but we all know who you are, all right, <laughs> you guys try to walk in all quiet and sliding in, I'm like, they ain't getting away with that, man, all right, no way, I'll get you a wife, get you here, all right, <laughs> amen, <laughs> brother uh, Sean said, happy day, happy day, <laughs> Hey, uh, some of you noticed these on the back back there. We got, a, I think we have five different tracks, new tracks. And uh, I just want to say I, I love these tracks that we, we have. Brother Kevin Murdoch put these together. The thing I like about these tracks is they're thought-provoking, okay? It's not just a here's a friendly invitation. As you give out this track, um, it's, it's, it's kind of something, if you look at it and read it yourself, you can, you can, it's a conversation piece, all right? Like this one right here, can you imagine? If you read the story here, uh, you're headed down, uh, you, you're on a thousand foot cliff, you begin to apply brakes and try to turn the steering wheel to avoid it, but the brakes fail and the steering wheel locks. I can just imagine about that time someone throws that down. Crazy people, Baptists, I'm telling you, they're weird. I knew it, I knew it, all right? Uh, but, but it goes on to say this, uh, as it says, in desperation, you try to jump out of the car. This sounds like a nightmare, <laughs> all right? I mean, I don't know where Brother Kevin, what he had pizza that night or what, you know. Uh, but the windows and the doors will not work. <laughs> it sounds like out of the twilight zone, all right, man? All right, what do you do? The simple answer is stop imagining, what a classic, right? I mean, ah, I, I actually got the track, I, 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 and then I, I was looking at that, and I'm going, I can't believe I'm giving this out. And then it finally got down there to stop imagining. You know what? The Bible talks about casting down imaginations. And, uh, you know, maybe people can just stop imagining that. But a good conversation piece, you know, you can just take off. And, Aren't you glad that's not true? Amen. And uh, really get them into the gospel. And, and just if you read this track, it'll help you use uh, the law to point them to Christ. And so a great track uh, to give out there and also a good, a good uh, starter point if you'll work at it. It's good. Take your Bibles tonight. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. How many read it? All 75 verses. Now, before I preach a text, I usually read it 10 times. I did not read this text 10 times. All right. I figured that out. That's 750 verses. All right. Like I couldn't use more Bible. But nonetheless, we're looking here in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to start in verse number 17. And then also, I need you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Tonight, I am preaching on the blessing of the Lord's Supper. The blessing of the Lord's Supper. And I hope it is a blessing to you. And uh, I believe it is a special gift given to the church. 
And when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about what many will refer to as the church, this big universal system that all Christians are a part of. Don't get that mixed up with the family of God. There's a difference. You don't have to be a part of a church to get to heaven. You can get saved without being in a church. All right. Now, the church made up of saved people should be following the doctrine that Christ has set down. We should be standing firm in the faith that was delivered to us. Amen? Uh, that's what a church is about. A local church ought to be standing strong on the doctrine that Christ taught. If we're not standing strong on that, we're just a country club. We're just a social event. Uh, there, there's, there's more to a biblical church than just coming to church. We want Bible doctrine that guides us and directs us. And so tonight I want to preach as we go through uh, Matthew chapter 26. As I stated this morning, uh, we're almost through the book of Matthew and, and just so excited about that, going through the books of the Bible and, and trying to highlight some things. And, and uh, I'm excited about Matthew chapter 27 in, in the coming time. But uh, tonight, Matthew chapter 26, just thinking about this, the blessing of the Lord's Supper. In fact, I was so excited about Matthew chapter 27, I really wanted to go there, all right? But the Lord said, no, you need to go here. So here we are tonight, and uh, I'm excited about that. You know, when Jesus was on this earth, he established two ordinances for his church. Two ordinances. It's real simple. I love simple, don't you? Amen. What's the first ordinance? Baptism. And the second one? Lord's Supper, all right? So uh, those are the two that we, we have that, that Jesus established. He, he gave to those that are following him. And so tonight we want to look at that. And there's, there's much teaching, and I'll say much false teaching, on this very subject. So it is important for us to have correct teaching. Amen? It's important for us, even as I preach this morning, that we worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. We need truth. We need truth. We need God's truth. And uh, uh, so we're going to look at that. Let's look at these verses. You're in Matthew chapter 26. Look with me at verse number 17 as we move through uh, as Jesus and his disciples observed the Passover, which was an Old Testament event that Jesus used to kick off the ordinance of what we know as the Lord's Supper, what we call the Lord's Supper. Let's look at this, okay? It says in Matthew chapter 26, verse number nine, uh, 17, Now the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Whither wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Now, just pause here for a second. You've got to have an imagination as you think about this. But can you imagine showing up at somebody's house and say, yeah, all 14 of us or 13 of us are going to be here. All right. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to come to your place. All right. And uh, I would be like, <clears throat> Jesus, can you maybe tell me? Have you talked to them? Do you, do, did you call them? Did you text them? <laughs> do they know we're coming? All right. Well, anyways, let's read on here. All right. And he said, go into the, I read that part. All right. Verse 19. And his disciples did as Jesus had appointed them. By the way, that's what we should all do. Amen. Okay. Three of us. Where's the rest of you at? It's Sunday night. You still sleeping? All right. All right. Let's wake up here. All right, it says here, uh, um, it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 19, and the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? I think Judas is sitting there, and he's watching everybody else, and he just jumps in. Hey, let's play this game. Is it I? Is it I? 
Is it I? So they're all asking, Lord, is it I? And they were, ex- uh, I read that, verse 23, I keep jumping back up. I think somebody needs it, all right? I'm not sure, all right? But here we go, verse number 23. And he answered and said, He which dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth out as it is written of him, but woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man that he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. What a minor note. Verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day might want to circle those two words, that day. By the way, how many are looking forward to that day? Amen? If you're a born-again believer, you're looking forward to that day. Amen? That day, that day. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to that day. It goes on to say, here in this passage of Scripture, uh, that day when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom, says there in verse number 30, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I like that last part, especially verse number 30. As we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, we always end it with singing a hymn and leaving, leaving uh, in remembrance of what Lord the Lord had done for us. The blessing of the Lord's Supper. Now go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Pick up with me, if you would, in verse number 23. Verse number 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament of my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till, I, till he come. Where, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and let him eat that of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that drinketh, uh, eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, um, and many sleep. For if ye would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should, be, should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye may come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. It's very important for us to understand what scripture is teaching us on the Lord's Supper. A church is given so that we can deal with sin. Now we live in a day and time where people don't want their sin exposed. But it's very important as we understand the accountability part that that we have in being plugged in with a local church that helps us realize I can't just live my own life however I want. I should, be, I should be answering, and God has given us an accountability program, the Lord's Supper, uh, the, 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 uh, the local church, to help us be what we need to be. 
And so tonight, I hope it will be a blessing to you as you look at these things from God's Word, understanding what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, just as he comes through, he introduces it, and then he says, Church, you're not judging, and, and people are dying because you're not, you're not taking care of the issues in, in the church. And even as you finish off there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll come back to that and look at that some more. But at this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us. Lord Jesus, tonight we pray that you would bless the preaching of your word. Lord, give me understanding. Give me clarity of heart and mind. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would get a hold of our hearts. God, tonight we don't want to just come to church and hear another message. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would move in our midst. Lord Jesus, I pray that, that you would uh, just work on our hearts. And Lord, each of us would be humble and, and uh, willing to do what you want us to do. I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would work in our midst, Lord. And that, that we would fall under conviction. Lord, we need you tonight. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There are some different names that are used for this thing we call the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. We call it the Lord's table. We call it the breaking of bread. The Roman Catholic Church calls the two ordinances uh, calls the these two ordinances sacraments. In their doctrine of faith they have seven sacraments that are part of salvation and uh, I'm not going to jump into all that but I'm I'm just going to tell you there's a lot of teaching in the Roman Catholic Church about this subject that that to me does not find a biblical base the reformation that's the people that the reformers and these were the people that broke away from the catholic church when you go back into history you're going to find that there was the there was the bible believers that jesus christ established his church now we need to get that straight because if we don't understand that jesus christ established the church then all we are a part of is a man-made organization man-made religion so we got that clear in our hearts and our minds. Jesus Christ established the local New Testament church. And he said this, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus Christ promised that the church would, would always be here until he comes back. There will, be a, there will be a remnant of people, of followers of Christ that are following the correct doctrine. Now, they haven't always been called Baptists. There's, they've been known by other names. I do not have the history down uh, to give it to you tonight. I know there's the Waldensians and, and uh, other groups that are mentioned there. But along with that, uh, about I think it's about 300, the Catholic Church was uh, uh, coming on the scene. And they came up with this ideal, the universal church. It's, it's everywhere. It, it, everybody's a part of it. It's a Catholic doctrine. As they came out with that, they began teaching salvation through the sacraments. Now, if you understand the Bible, the Bible teaches us that the ordinances that Jesus Christ gave to us, baptism does not get you saved. Come on, Baptist, let me try that again. Baptism doesn't get you saved. Amen. Amen. Neither does the Lord's Supper. But their ordinances, uh, ordinances is something that we are to keep. If we're followers of Christ, we are told, keep these. Come on. If I had some donkeys and I asked you to keep them and I came over to your house, and I say, where's my donkeys? I don't know. I'm like you, Pastor, I can't find them. <laughs> I'd say you did not keep my donkeys very good. I don't want to stand before God. And what he's told me in his word to keep, I don't want to stand before him and say, I don't know what happened to him. We know that the Roman Catholic Church has come so far to make these sacraments, what they call sacraments, 
to be a process of salvation. So the Reformation comes along, the Reformers, and they say, no, we don't accept that. Now many people think that we as Baptists are Reformers. Okay, We, we did not reform from the Catholic Church. We, we, we were being, Bible believers were being persecuted for being Bible believers. Go back and study what happened with the Apostles. As they stood on the doctrine that I'm preaching to you tonight, what Christ handed to them and uh, what he passed on to them from the Passover time, which was a Hebrew Old Testament observance, and he changed that even while he was here on earth. He says, hey, I want you to do this. As oft as you do this in remembrance of me, he hands off to the local New Testament church, the apostles who were, who were part of the first church, he hands off to them these doctrinal things that we are to observe. Now, it's good to be a Baptist. Where are the rest of you at? It's good to be a Baptist. This is going to be a two-hour message if you guys don't wake up, okay? All right? I, I mean... Um, so we, we have the Reformation, and, and they, they saw that, that Christ's teaching of these two new ordinances uh, uh, for the church um, was not for salvation, but it was something that, that, that Christ had commanded them to keep, and it was a blessing to the church if they would. Come on. It is a blessing. If we use it as the Bible tells us how to use it. The Bible believers over the years, if we go back as Jesus Christ started the local New Testament church, has taught the truth of local church doctrine. I'm not going to get into uh, all the ramifications of that uh, just for the sake of time. But we know this, that these two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is a gift that God has given to the church. And sadly, it has been corrupted. It's been corrupted throughout history by false doctrine, or may I say false churches. Can I put my quotation around churches? False churches and lazy Christians. You say, how come you say lazy Christian? If we know what God says for us to do, I'm being nice by just saying we're lazy. Because not only are we lazy, we're disobedient. Because these are things that we should all keep. These are things that, as Bible believers, should be important to us. If I'm stretching this, please show me it from the Bible. Not right now. You would mess up my train of thought. But I challenge you, study the Word of God. I challenge you, go into the Word of God. I'm taking you to the Word of God. I'm taking you to Matthew chapter 26 when Jesus Christ established this. I'm taking you to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when Paul goes through the Lord's Supper and says there's problems in the church. Why, why church? Because the church won't judge. It ought to bother a Christian husband not to treat his wife right. We as husbands should be a testimony of the grace of God in our life. And if we're saved, we should treat our wife and our kids correct. I know that's simple. But church... That's something that we should be dealing with. Let's look at the blessings of the Lord's Supper. Let's ask ourselves some questions. Number one, why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? What happens during the Lord's Supper? Who should partake of the Lord's Supper? 
and how should we partake of the Lord's Supper? So let's begin with that first question. Why do we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper? Look with me there in Matthew 26 at verse number 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. That should be reason enough. If the question is asked, why do we do this? Why, why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? Because Jesus Christ established it. Amen? He gave it to the local New Testament church. In the parallel passage, I'm not going to jump over there, but in Luke 22 and verse number 19, you will find these words. This do in remembrance of me. Amen? This do in remembrance of me. We, we, we see that on the, on the communion table. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, if it says do this in remembrance of me, it's the wrong version. Just a thought, all right? This do in remembrance of me. Uh, uh, just, just a little thing there. Matthew 26, look at verse number 29. You're there. It says this. But I say unto you, I will not drink uh, henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you, with you in my Father's kingdom. I believe that the ideal here, as Jesus is talking to the disciples, and even for us uh, today, it is, is that uh, uh, he is not talking about an invisible spiritual kingdom of God here that Jesus established on the earth, but, but of the future literal kingdom to come where believers will be eating and drinking and celebrating with the Lord and the return and the marriage supper of the Lamb and the bride and he will, will, will be present there and it's covered in Revelation chapter 19 and uh, this so-called last supper is really not the last supper. Amen. The, 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 this was not the last supper that the disciples will have with the Lord Jesus. Now, it was the last supper here on this earth as we know it, but there's coming another one. Hello? Amen. I was looking forward to that meal yesterday out at the Atlas. I They put it at 2 o'clock. I was trying to decide, do I eat lunch or do I hold off? Brother Ronnie had the same problem, all right? We both decided to hold off so we could chow down, man. And boy, did we. All right. I didn't even have to eat supper last night. Well, I did eat some popcorn. That's manna, all right? Uh, popcorn, that don't count, all right? Uh, but um, I guess I have to tell you. Well, I'm not going to tell you, all right? So uh, we see here that as we eat and drink, we are not only to remember Christ by looking back at what he did on Calvary's cross. We are looking forward to a time when he will return and his kingdom will be established. And we look forward to the supper of the Lamb. It, uh, what, a, what a blessing it's, it's going to be even as we remember this. Even as we look back, and, and not only that, we can also look forward to what Jesus Christ is talking about, even right here in Matthew chapter uh, 26 and verse number 29, as he, as he says to his disciples that they will eat with him in heaven. When the disciples ate this Passover meal, in the original context of why they were there on this night that we just read about in Matthew chapter 26 as they were coming together. They were looking back at Israel's redemption out of Egypt. Uh, verse number 17, verse number 19 uh, kind of covers some of that there as, 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 we, as they talk about the Passover but now Jesus takes these elements and he gives them a new significance 
as he takes the bread, as he takes the wine, which we know is unfermented grape juice. No, I'm going to stop right there. There's too many Christians getting drunk. Alcohol is a tool of the devil. He took that bread, unleavened bread, unfermented grape juice, and said, this do in remembrance of me. We need to remember that Jesus redeemed us by going to Calvary's cross. He did not redeem us out from Egypt. We need to remember not the Passover lamb, but we need to remember, as John the Baptist pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. We need to remember that as you eat of the unleavened bread, what Christ did as the bread of life and giving of his body to be our substitute, to go to Calvary's cross and be broken for you and for me. He died in our place. We remember his blood, his blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. And we need to remember that as we drink of that cup, it is not the old covenant under Moses, but the new covenant under Christ Jesus. Why do we celebrate it? Because Jesus established it. I hope it's a blessing to you. I hope as pastor is going over these things, it, it helps you. Well, what happens during the Lord's Supper? I'll, I'll give you a few false views and uh, two false views and then one, one I believe that is correct. So let's move through this rapidly. The Roman Catholic Church calls it transubstantiation. Can you spell that for me? All right. Uh, transubstantiation. Trans means to change. Uh, to, to transform, uh, substantiation. In this case, the bread and the wine is transformed or changed into the literal body and blood of Christ by a miracle. That's what they teach. It's, it's by a miracle. They refer to it as the real sacrifice that properties uh, remove sin. These double miracles in outward appearance of it does not change. It still looks like bread and wine. It's the transformation that's more than the eye, than, than meets the eye. In other words, they're telling you something that you can't even see it. But that's what they believe. When you literally take of that, that's why when we ask Catholics, have you received Christ? What's their answer going to be? I sure did. Whenever I took of that bread. Why? Because that's what the priest tells them. You're receiving Christ. That's literally it. So that's the teaching of it. That's not the same thing that Christ taught us about salvation. He didn't say, eat this bread and you guys are safe. What did he say about the Lord's Supper? This is due in remembrance of me. Remember what I did for you. Remember what I saved you from. Remember where I brought you to. Remember what we're looking forward for. The reformers, they go with this term, consubstantiation. Stance plus con. In other words, with. Christ present with the substance. The phrases in, with, under are used by them. Martin Luther, who was a reformer, he said this. He, he, he says, uh, my view on it, it's better called sacramental union. And not all, in, all Lutherans embrace consubstantiation. In other words, in, in Luther's own words, we do not make Christ's body out of the bread nor do we say his body comes into existence out of the bread. We say that his body, which long ago was made and came into existence, is present when we say, this is my body. 
For Christ commanded us uh, to say, let this become my body or make my body there or this is my body. Now, I believe that is some taking and twisting of the scriptures as he came to that conclusion. But I believe this. As we go over to 1 Corinthians, and I want you to turn over there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we're talking about what happens during the Lord's Supper, I believe here in just a few verses I can show this to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's pick up in verse number 23 and answer the question, what happens during the Lord's Supper? It says in verse number 23, for I have received... Of the Lord, that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, my friend, that's right out of the word of God, is it not? It's easy to understand what we do during or what happens during the Lord's Supper. We move on, verse number 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this is a a cup is a New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let me ask you a question. Do you see the word remembrance? What is it about? It's about remembering. Remembering what he did. His body was given to us, given for us. His blood was shed for us. What is the Lord's Supper about? It's about remembering those two things specifically. Now look at verse number 26. For as oft as ye do eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So it's something that, that Christ established. It should be important to every born-again believer. That, that we be a part of this, that we understand what Scripture teaches us. Thirdly, how should we take of the Lord's Supper? Um, there's a lot here. Um, trying to decide where to go. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Pick up in verse number 1. Pick up in verse number 1. You ought to be happy. I just shaved 30 minutes off this message. All right. How many are enjoying the word of God tonight? Amen. I hope it's helping us. Amen. I hope we understand what church is about. And I hope we stand on God's word very strongly. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse number 1, and I want us to understand this, that, that uh, as, as, as we're talking about this, uh, how who, or who should take of the Lord's Supper, let me just establish some things here in, in the context of this. In verse number 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all and were all baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat of the same spiritual meat, did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, um, the analogy here is 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 for us to understand that these were followers of Christ. Uh, even even the analogy of uh, 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 the word that is being used there, baptized into Moses, uh, following along with them. As we come down to verse number four, there that rock was Christ, uh, even as, as, as these are followers of Christ. Now jump down to verse number 16 in the same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 16. As it says, the cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, right here in this verse is where I believe we get the word communion. What is it talking about? This is a powerful verse, and I don't have time to preach it, and I'm I'm flying over this a little bit faster than than what I really want. But, But I want us to understand this. 
and, and see how sweet it is. And if you miss this, you're going to miss part of the blessing of the Lord's Supper. So I don't want you to miss this, but, but do you understand that word communion? Uh, uh, even as it's used there, this, this cup is the blessing uh, which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Let me ask you a question. Where would you be without the blood of Christ? You'd still be in your sins. Let me ask you a question. Are you thankful for his blood? Do you understand the communion, the, the coming together of that, that we have in, in, in what Christ did for us? How about his body? The communion, where, where would we be without it if we, if we didn't have, oh, where would we be? His body was broken for you and for me to pay our sin debt. We would still be trying and we'd still be failing. But this communion, this thing that we have in the Lord's Supper is something that we treasure so much. It's called that communion in, 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 in drawing us close to each other. We really don't use that word very much. And uh, I wished I would have done more time to, even to put this together. But, but I hope and pray that it can be a, a help to us. Even as we look at this and as we are considering this here tonight. Jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse number two. Now, I know I'm doing a lot of jumping around, okay? Um, but I believe it's in context. I believe that um, pointing out some things for you to understand and consider. I want you to know this. Paul is writing to Gentiles. He is not telling them to go be a part of a Hebrew festival. But he is telling them they need to be a part of what Jesus Christ established. Look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 at verse number 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols, idols even as you were led. So these Gentiles were not being told by Paul that they needed to observe the Old Testament Jewish observation. No, the New Testament ordinances was that Christ, the Passover, died in our place. And that's what his followers were to observe. They had a religious way where they followed, as the scripture calls it, dumb idols. But now they have a new way to walk. And that is following the doctrine that is laid out for us in the word of God. We don't have time for it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The passage is dealing with the Lord's Supper. And uh, it's talking about somebody that's living in sin. And you're not to eat with them. Christian, it's important for us not to wink at sin as if it's not going on. I find that people that don't want to deal with sin do something with the Lord's Supper. They move it out of their life. Christian, tonight, we should not move it out of our life. We should embrace it. As we embrace it, we follow what God has given us. And if you have time to look at that, I would encourage you to go read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I was, I was going to cover that, but just for sake of time, we're going to move on. Who, can, who should partake of the Lord's Supper? I believe that it's a baptized, or when I, when I put it this way, a member of that church. A member that says, I'll be accountable to other believers. See, membership today is not important. Membership as we see it, if you just show up, they start counting you a member. I know churches, they don't check where people got baptized. Thus, when you talk to people that are going to their church, and I've, not, I've talked to people outdoor knocking, I said, when did you get saved? 
they're supposedly in a Bible-believing, preaching church, which I praise God for. But if we do not talk to people about how they get saved, this person said, I've been going here for three years. When did you get saved? I got saved when I got baptized at the Mormon church. I did what you did. I went, what? How do we have members in our church that don't even know what it means to be saved? It's because we call them members no matter what they do. As long as they sit, if you sit in a pew, you're a member. My friend, I don't think that's what God had in plan. And God has something for us as, as he's given us the Lord's Supper that we are to be a part of as we're a member in good standing with the local church. What is a member in good standing? Well, you know, sometimes we get into sin. It's sad. Do you know how many stories I've heard as a pastor about how many pastors have gotten to sin? And parents tell me, my kids won't even go to church because their pastor did this. My friend, if you got your eyes on men, you got your eyes on the wrong thing. You need to get it on the Lord. But even so, the Lord has given us something in the church where we, when sin happens, we don't just act like it's not there. That's what, that's what, the, that's what we're dealing with here. That's what we're looking at here. This is, this is what, as you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when you get down to the end of it, that's what it's talking about. Hey, judge this among you. Deal with sin. Get, get to the root of this and, and deal with it. Um, so we have members in good standing. And then the questions come up, whose job is it to examine and exclude from participation that immoral member? And I challenge you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 2. Uh, in fact, let's just jump over there right quick. We're not that far away because Paul says this moreover. Uh, chapter five, I was in chapter four. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourn that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. And so the church was acting like nothing was going on. And this guy that was in their church was living in fornication, living in sin. Now, if we don't deal with sin, sin is going to abound among us. Because when you smite the scorner, they flee. Other people are aware. This church means business. This church is not just going to act like sin doesn't exist. This church is going to say, hey, we're going to do what God's told us to do. We're going to deal with this. And there's some things that, you know what today's society is saying? I don't like that kind of Christianity. So I'm saying, what pages are you ripping out of your Bible? See, this is not something I've made up. This is something that's in the Word of God. And it helps us to, to think about this. Our young people shouldn't be living in fornication. I can't understand how people will come and listen to preaching and go home unmarried and act like they're married. I don't get it. Except for our sinful heart is very deceitful. Over in Uganda, when somebody gets saved, over there, immorality is rampant. And when someone gets saved, one way that they know they're truly saved is most of the men and most of the women separate. In fact, one missionary was just asking, uh, would you help buy some goats? <laughs> Brother Matt Stensis, because he has some young men that got saved, separated from their woman, but they don't have enough money to pay the bride's price. Now, what happens over there in that society is that mom and dad know poor little Johnny doesn't have enough money. This is the girl's. If I was the girl's dad, this would never happen. Hello. <laughs> little Johnny doesn't have enough money, but he lets them shack up anyways. 
and thus the whole society is corrupt. You see, when we deal with sin, it helps us to set things in order. And I believe that Paul is telling the church here, you have not rather mourned. You just act like nothing's going on. It's, it's, not, it's not your business. But as a local church, it's part of what Jesus Christ holds us accountable for. Paul makes it very clear that it is the right and duty of the church to fence the table. Who should, be, who should take part of this? And I know as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and people have asked this, I forget which verse it is, we read it tonight. Let a man so examine himself. That's after the church has said, we're ready to partake of this. And then there's a self-examining. And we as a church ought to take it really serious. Because if there's sin in our life and sin so deceives us, it needs to be confessed. By the way, be sure your sins will find you out. It, it will catch up to you. You can get away with it. But it will catch up with you if you're a child of God. That's, that's Bible preaching. That's, that's what the Bible teaches us. Okay, we come to our last question. How should we take of the Lord's Supper? Uh, start there in verse number 27. Um, we, we need to make sure that um, we need to, as verse number 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup unworthily. Now, what's unworthily? My friend, there's nothing you can do of yourself to make yourself worthy. Okay, none of us are better than anybody else, all right? But all of us can claim the blood, amen? Now, I'm not talking about go live in sin and then ask God to forgive you. That, that should not be our spirit. In fact, if that is our spirit, something's wrong, amen? We're not just running to God, okay, I need to get this cleared up. It ought to be something inside of us, even as sin breaks God's heart, sin breaks our heart. And sin has to be dealt with. And that's what this is talking about, taking of it unworthily, not examining ourselves, not searching God's face and say, try me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me, even as David cried out. That, that ought to be something that is taking part in the Lord's Supper. Not only that, look at verse number uh, 28. As, and here's the one about the self-examining. But let a man examine himself. And, then, uh, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And an examining of ourselves. Maybe we've been fussing with somebody in the church. Maybe we need to examine ourselves. Where's this contention coming from? Maybe there's some pride that I need to get rid of. There's some examining of ourselves. And that's what, that's what I'm talking about, the blessing of the Lord's Supper. Because we can examine ourselves and we can get it right with God. Look at verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Judgment will come. My friend, the, the blessing, as you see in verse number 29 and verse number 30, for, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. There's a, there's a problem when sin reigns. Verse number 31 tells us, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Hey, what a blessing it is. We can deal with sin in our own lives. And then we don't have to stand underneath that judgment of God. And then this last one here, verse number 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. You know, we need to be t thinking about others. 
We live in a society that is so self-centered, it stinks. People come to church, and instead of asking the church, how can I be a blessing to the church, they come with this attitude, be a blessing to me. That's the wrong kind of Christianity. The way we come to a church is, how do I get plugged in? How do I serve? How do I be accountable to what God has, has put me to be a part of? That's the blessing of the Lord's Supper. That's what all this is about. And I hope tonight we grab hold of it. One day, your pastor will give account for you. And I want to do it with joy. I want to give it with joy. What a joy. As we followed what God's word said. As we were striving to be obedient to all that God has taught us. Amen? How many believe it's important to be faithful to the house of God? Amen. You wouldn't be here on Sunday night. That's an easy question, man. You did raise your hand, didn't you? He's like, what, 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 what? <laughs> I show. God help us, amen? Church, I love you. It's a privilege to be your pastor. But I want you to understand what God's word says. And it's not just something that we leave off. It's something we embrace. It's a blessing to us. I want to ask you tonight, is God speaking to your heart? It's invitation time. Let's do something with it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word. Lord, we thank you for the doctrine that we find therein. Lord, would it help us even tonight to grow closer to you? Lord, thank you for helping us understand these truths that we've looked at tonight. Lord, I pray that each of us would have a humble heart before you. Bless now this invitation. Have your will and way in our hearts. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, let's sing. Page number 489, God's spoken to your heart tonight. The altar's open. Would you come? Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all.